Hello, it's us again, but this time you can hear us. That was my mistake. Uh, a thousand apologies. I, uh, I uh, didn't have a wire plugged in. and we, You were seeing us, but you weren't hearing us. So, hi again. Uh, I'm Dave with Ephesians Vision Ministries, and glad to have you with us today. Beautiful, sunshiny day here in Central Oregon. God's blessed us with sun. We are so excited about uh, finally having some summer weather here. The spring and the winter have been very, very long, and we're excited about uh, maybe getting some warm weather. Uh, Bill would like to hear from you tonight. If you uh, would like to write to him, he'd love to hear from you, to know if you've received Jesus as a result of his teaching, and just whatever you want to tell him. Uh, he's a really nice guy, so make sure you say nice things about him. Uh, his email address is bill at evm1.info. That's bill at evm1.info. And especially if you've accepted the Lord because of his teaching, he'd, he'd like to know about that. Uh, what else do we want to tell you? Um, tomorrow night, prophecy teaching, prophecy and end times with Dr. Tom Watson. Looking forward to that. Also, his lovely wife, Georgianne, always brings us, she's been following the news from a Christian standpoint and always brings us some news insights about uh, what just kind of piques her interest in the news regarding to how it relates to uh, prophecy and just uh, what God's doing in the world. We do want to remind you that tomorrow night we will have the class Prophecy and End Times. It's Friday nights at 7. But next Friday, the 10th of June, the class will still be here, but it's not going to be on the Internet because I have to be out of town. But it will be here the following week. So tomorrow night, if you want to watch it, I'm sorry, Next week, if you want to watch it, uh, you'll have to come in here in person and, uh, and watch it. Um, we have 24-7 prayer going on here at Butler Market in Boyd Acres. We've got some more exciting stuff we want to announce, but we're not quite ready to do so yet. But it involves uh, preaching the gospel to the world. And I'd love to tell you, but I promised it wouldn't until we get some other things kind of resolved first. Um, I think that's it. What about the frying pan? Oh, we are having an outreach at uh, near McMinimums. It's near Troy Field, downtown Bend, Saturday, June 25th, 3 o'clock in the afternoon. Uh, the Freedom Team is going to be performing, and they perform feats of strength. They blow up hot water bottles till they explode. They fold up frying pans with their bare hands. They rip phone books in two. Have you ever tried to rip a phone book in two? No. You want me to go get your phone book and you no, can try it? Okay. I'm just working on paper. <laughs> I've got a frying pan if you want to try to fold a frying no. pan. No. Well, the Freedom Team can do that. And it's going to be June 25th. That's a Saturday at 3 in the afternoon uh, near Troy Field. And that's by the Environmental Center, which is a block south of uh, McMinimums. Uh, in downtown Bend. If you're familiar with Bend, you know where that's at. It's free of charge. Come on down and learn about how Jesus has really impacted their lives. So, God's doing some amazing things. Tonight we're going to hear about the book of John, and uh, you can hear us now, which is a good thing. Amen. So, here, here, here is Bill and Beverly. Praise the Lord. Thank you, Jesus. My name is Bill, and this is Beverly, my wife, and we are here in Bend, Oregon. Uh, sharing the bird, I mean the Word of God, which is the Book of John, and if you've been watching or keeping track of us and going along with us, I deeply appreciate it. And uh, tonight uh, we will be uh, on Chapter Seven. We ended Chapter Six, and uh, Chapter Six. There is so much information to um, to pick up. Uh, in the area of review, just for a few minutes, we have uh, in chapter 6 where Jesus uh, is having the discussion with the multitude of people about where he came from. And uh, he talks about that he came down several times. We're in chapter 6 discussing the review. So chapter 6, verse 33, he says he came down. And then in 38, he said he came down. And uh, it goes on to say that in verse 42, uh, they used the word down. So he uses it quite a bit. Uh, in verse 50, it says he came down as bread, which came down from heaven. A man may eat thereof and not die. He's referring to himself. And in verse 51, 
he talks about I am the living bread that came down and also in verse 58 he talks about this bread which came down so he uses the word down quite a bit and if you you read this tonight in your private uh, devotion you will find there's lots of things that Jesus said that was overlooked by his listeners it's like they wasn't exactly tuned in to to what he was saying now we moved on to chapter 7 and I would like to say something at this particular point in the teaching and that is up to this point Jesus had a conversation uh, basically with uh, the people at the at the wedding feast which is in chapter 2 and chapter 3 he talked to Nicodemus it was almost a one-way conversation and in chapter uh, um, f the tear end of uh, the, the last part of chapter 3 uh, he is talking uh, to a, a man and then uh, it talks about in chapter 4 uh, he's talking to a woman of Samaritan and in chapter 5 He's talking to a man who was crippled for 38 years. I guess my point is, in chapter 6, he gets in a conversation with many people. Many people are entering into it. And in chapter 7, uh, there's lots of people coming in, like the scribes and the Pharisees, the Jewish people that are in the midst of the feast, and the disciples, and what they're thinking, and... So we're going to have to go into why are they thinking this? Why are they asking questions about uh, what Jesus is doing? And uh, so I'm going to be switching over to the, to the old King James because it flows kind of easier. Uh, it's because I practically memorized it. And uh, in the New King James, I got to slow down quite a bit. So the, the New King James... Uh, does, does not have the these and thous, and uh, it is my prayer that that you you understand what, what I'm saying, and and if you do not understand, I will say it in modern day language. the The New King James is easier to read, but it is a little bit more difficult when you me literally memorize the Old King James and you grew up with this for about twenty or thirty years. So. I'm going to ask my wife, Beverly, where are you reading, the old or the new? Old. Old. Would you read the old up until, where, where's your cutoff? Thirteen. Thirteen. Okay, nice and loud. After these things, Jesus walked in Galilee, for he would not walk in Jewry, because the Jews sought to kill him. Now the Jews' feasts of tabernacles was at hand. His brother therefore said unto him, Depart hence, and go into Judea, that thy disciples also may see the works that you do. For there is no man that doeth anything in secret, and he himself seeketh to be known openly. If, you, if thou do these things, show thyself to the world. For neither did his brethren believe in him. Then Jesus said unto them, My time is not yet come, but your time is always ready. The world cannot hate you, but me it hate, hateth, because I testify of it, that the works thereof are evil. Go ye up to this feast. I go not up yet unto this feast, for my time is not yet full come. When he had said these words unto them, he abode still in Galilee. But when his brethren were gone up, then went he also up unto the feast, not openly, but as it were in secret. Then the Jews saw him at the feast and said, Where is he? And there was much murmuring among the people concerning him. For some said, He is a good man. Others said, Nay, but he deceiveth the people. Howbeit no man spoke openly of him for fear of the Jews. Amen. Okay, so now here we are back to chapter 7, verse 1. And we try to go along and, and break this down a little bit so it's easier to understand. Uh, in my old Bible here, I don't have commentary notes, so if you see me looking back and forth, it's because I'm trying to pick up some. And I don't have notes written down here, so... I'm just going along and, and teaching uh, what the Holy Spirit uh, allows me to, on my heart. And sometimes that's a little bit, uh, it, it's good because I don't know who the audience is out there. 
and but he knows. He knows. He knows. And he knows. I may be talking to people that are quite mature in the Word of God, who want to hear more meat, and they may come to the conclusion that maybe I do not know the areas of the Bible in that particular area of, of meat. But believe me, I do know the meat. I do know the prime rib. I mean, we can go very, very deep, but it would take months just in one chapter. And uh, then there's other people that are basically uh, drinking the milk of the Word of God. So they need, they, they need to be uh, encouraged to understand who Jesus is. And believe it or not, there's a lot of people who don't know our Lord Jesus Christ. Now here we are on the tail end of chapter 6. They got in this big discussion about Jesus coming down and who he was. And it got to the point where 70 of his disciples, because he had more disciples than just 12, but it said from that time, verse chapter 6, verse 6, 6, so 666, six, six, kind of a, a play on words here, you know, uh, it doesn't have nothing to do with the mark of the beast. It just says 666. Six, six. From that time, many of his disciples went back and walked no more with him. Then said Jesus unto the twelve, Will you also go away? So he's asking his twelve disciples because people are walking away because they're saying, This is a very difficult sermon to understand. Uh, Drink my blood and eat my flesh. It doesn't mean that he was promoting cannibalism. It means that he was saying he wanted an intimate relationship with him. In other words, you put the word of God inside of you like a cow eating grass. And the cow chews up the grass and it goes down into his belly and he brings it up again. And he keeps chewing on it again. I think it's called chewing the, the cud. Chewing the cud. Do you have anything to add to that? Well, that's what we need to do with the Word of God. We need to meditate on it, which is another word of simply for think about it. And think about what all it means and what the Lord is telling us. So, so in the midst of meditation, uh, you have found in your life, as well as my life, that the Holy Spirit brings us into revelation knowledge of insights. Yes. What He wants us to know. That's right. Because sometimes when we're reading the Word of God, we will look at something and and say, where did that come from? And it was always <laughs> there, but we just noticed it. That's right. That's, that's right. That's because where the Holy Spirit will say, stop right here. Look at this. Meditate on this. You know. So here's a situation in chapter 6, verse uh, 70. And Jesus answered them, have I not chosen you twelve, and one of you is a devil? He spoke of Judas Iscariot, son of Simon, for he was that sh shall betray him, being one of the twelve. Now let's start off here in verse uh, 1, verse chapter 7, and you got like a feedback of what, or, or a background of what was going on uh, in the, the sermon that he just came out of chapter 6. And in verse 1, chapter 7, after these things, Jesus walked in Galilee, for he did not walk in Jewry, because the Jews sought to kill him. So they were trying to kill him. Now, why were they trying to kill him? Remember back in chapter 5, when Jesus healed the man who was crippled, for 38 years. Remember that uh, time? And he uh, told the man to get up and walk. Yes. And then they stopped him and said, who told you to pick up your bed and walk? You know, it was a Sabbath day. You're not supposed to do that. So not only did uh, Jesus, uh, uh, well, let me see what's in chapter 5, verse 15. The man departed and told the Jews that it was Jesus which hath made him whole. This is the crippled man in chapter 5. 
And therefore did the Jews persecute Jesus and sought to slay him because he has done this thing on the Sabbath day. It just shows you that they were very religious. They thought they had to follow rigidly every religious law they had. Right. But Jesus came and brought grace and truth and healed a man on the Sabbath day, which was a no-no for them. But Jesus said it's lawful to do good on the Sabbath day, to do right. It's not against the law, in other words, to heal someone on the Sabbath day. That's perfectly not okay. Well, you know, it's, it's kind of funny. I don't mean to be a, a, a prosecuting attorney, but uh, uh, the, the fact is that they could circumcise a child on the eighth day, right? Right. And if the eighth day fell on the Sabbath day, they didn't stop doing it. No. Because, and that was work. That was work for somebody. Yeah. And uh, so uh, there was a uh, misunderstanding there because uh, his heavenly father does good things on the Sabbath day. Yes. I mean, the sun don't stop shining because it's, uh, it's the Sabbath day. But in verse 17, but Jesus answered them, my father worketh hitherto and I work. So right there was the two things that came together. Healing a man and then saying that he was the son of God. Now we have people today that do not or believe that Jesus is the son of God. It's because they do not read the Bible. If they read the Bible very, very critically and... Uh, try to find something wrong or, or a contradiction, they couldn't find any. There's been stories of people who have opened up the Bible and read it from cover to cover, trying to find something wrong or a contradiction, and they end up getting saved because they couldn't find nothing wrong. In fact, I think there's a movie about that, right? Out there, about a man doing that. Okay, now here's the situation. We find that Jesus... Um, the Jews were out there trying to, to kill, kill him, which is in verse 1. Verse 2, now the Jews' feast of tabernacle was at hand. His brethren, or which the New King James says his brothers, because uh, Jesus had brothers. See, Mary and Joseph had other children after Jesus was born. But Jesus uh, came about because of the overshadowing of the Holy Spirit. Remember, Mary was a virgin. And when she gave birth to Jesus, Joseph was not involved with that uh, birth. But Mary and Joseph, uh, in the act of being a husband and wife, had more children. They had boys and girls, which we could say they are half-brothers of Jesus. So right here in verse 3, his brothers, or the brethren, Therefore said unto him, Depart hence and go into Judah, that thy disciples also may see the works that thou doest. So this is his brothers talking. For they, for there is no man that doeth any th uh, thing in secret, and he himself seeketh to be known openly. If thou doest these things, show thyself to the world. Sounds like good advice, don't it? You know, but sometimes you got to be careful. Uh, all advice is not godly advice, you know. Now, it says, For neither did his brothers believe in him. Now, this is his own brothers. This is something to think about. Now, Jesus was doing a lot of, of miracles. I mean, the, the multitudes was coming to him. The blinds had their eyes, I mean, blind people had their eyes open and uh, crippled people were walking away and the deaf and dumb could hear and speak. Those who had leprosy was completely cured and their skin was made whole. And so whether they didn't believe uh, or understand or comprehend that uh, um, their mother Mary gave birth to Jesus, uh, and I'm sure the family knew about this, but there was a little bit of sarcasm there about this situation coming from his own brothers. Then Jesus said unto them, 
My time has not yet come. But your time is always ready. The world cannot hate you, but me it hateth because I testified of it that the works thereof are evil. Now, Jesus is saying that there's evil in the world. You know, we are living in an age today where people don't want to admit that there's evil. It's really difficult to explain because there's evil all around us. All you have to do is listen to the evening news and you know that. Right. And you can't see killings and murders and wars and people getting blowed up and killed. And uh, I mean, just yesterday, there was 46 people blowed up with, with a bomb. And in another country, there was 18. In another country, there was 37. And these are people just getting blowed up. Uh, and uh, because somebody else doesn't like them or like the way they worship God or whatever, God doesn't want us to do that. He wants us to love one another. Jesus said to love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. You know, so that's what Jesus wants to, us to do. He doesn't want us to kill each other. That's ridiculous. And anyway, Jesus said, my time has not yet come, but your time is always ready. The world cannot hate you, but it hates, but it hates me because I testify of it that the works thereof are evil. So I'm backing up the, for you to get a running start, you know, in case you're following along. Go we up into this feast. I go not up yet until this feast, for my time is not yet full come. Now, your translation may leave out the word yet. He's not saying that he's not going to go up there. He's, he's saying this is not the time for me to go up there. Uh, he's on a divine time schedule because he's under the time schedule of his Heavenly Father. That's right. He's not under the time sh schedule of his brothers or the, or the disciples or Matthew, Mark, Luke, or John. He's not under the dis uh, time schedule of the scribes and Pharisees. He's not motivated by anybody else except his Heavenly Father. That's where he took his, I'd say orders, but it wasn't orders. <laughs> Direction. Directions. Directions, well. So um, the thing is, that's what we need to do. We need to be uh, motivated by the he our Heavenly Father, by the precious Holy Spirit, and the words that Jesus said, and what is said in the Bible. It's what's in the Bible that counts. Now, um, verse uh, 9, verse 9, right? Okay. okay. Then he said, th then he said these words unto them. Oh, well, when he said these words unto them, uh, he abides still in Galilee. So he's staying back a little bit and his brothers are going up but when his brothers were going up they left right they're going up then when he also up unto the feast not openly but as it was in secret so this kind of word kind of means that he wasn't sneaking around but he went up there and not at that particular time just to mingle in with the people and do what he was supposed to do. Then the Jews sought him at the feast and said, Where is he? So they're all looking for him because they want to kill him. But see, he did not come to this world to be killed or to be stoned or to go out in the ocean and drown in the sea. Mm -hmm. uh, he, he didn't come for them for a mob to uh, attack him. He came here for one reason, and that was to be lifted up on the cross. That's right. If you go backwards in, in the book of John, uh, you may find this very, very fascinating to go backwards. You might not have ever seen people go backwards in, in the Bible before, but <laughs> like chapter 3, verse 
14, this is Jesus talking to Nicodemus. He said, as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up. So right there, going backwards, you see that he's already explaining, you know, what's going to happen. Um, if you look at chapter 1, this is something else that's really uh, something. You remember when he chased out the money changers out of the, out of the temple? And everybody was saying, by, by what authority do you do this? Well, in, in chapter 2, uh, in verse 19, Jesus answered and said unto them, Destroy this temple, and in three days I will rise it up. So we know that Jesus was sent here on a divine mission. Uh, in chapter 3, verse 16, it says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believe in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Now, um, I will get back to this word believing in just a few moments. Well, maybe I should just do it right now so I don't forget. You know, many times we walk into in the jails and stuff like that, and sometimes you're sitting in there, not so much in, in, a, in a prison, because in a prison people are dead serious about the Word of God. I mean, they come in with three or four trans... Uh, trans I, 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 translations. Translations. I, I lost the word there for a second. Translations, and they have, some have a strong concordance, and they got a Bible dictionary, and so it's not an, a class that you would think would be uh, immature. It is extremely the opposite. It's a very, very mature class in, in prison because they have a lot of time to study the Word of God. But in jail, they just got locked up a week ago, you know, so they're just coming off, off whatever they did, you know, drugs or dope or whatever, and you say to them, uh, how many people believe in Jesus? Well, they all, all their hands may go up. We all believe in Jesus. Well, you know what? The devil believes in Jesus. So are the demons. But that don't mean you're born again. There's a difference between just believing and accepting Jesus Christ in your heart and making him the Lord of your life and becoming a born-again Christian. Big difference. So, verse 10 but when his brothers were gone up, then went he also up unto the feast, not openly, but as it was in secret. Then the Jews sought at the feast and said, Where is he? And there was much murmuring among the people concerning him. And some said, He is a good man. Others said, Nay, but he deceives the people. How do you think they come to the conclusion that he deceives the people? Because of what, what the religious leaders were saying? Well, when you're stuck with your religion so deep into it that you can't see beyond it, you can't accept Jesus. You can't accept anything because your mind is closed. You're where you're at, you're not going to move. You're not going to move even if you see the miracles. That's right. That, That's are, that right. are right in front of you. That's right. You know, and, and, and that's kind of sad. Uh, it's very sad. In fact, we were discussing uh, the other day, my wife and I, and uh, well, I guess I can afford to take a, a rapid trail. It's only uh, 7.30. We're down here to verse 13. We were home discussing something the other day, and it's amazing. Uh, I went over to Portland uh, four, five, six, seven years ago, and uh, went to a, a Billy Graham crusade, not a Billy Graham, but a Benny Hinn crusade. And there's about 10, 15,000 people there in this auditorium. And uh, uh, people were getting healed, you know. And I, 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 I noticed something that was just amazing. They had all these people get out of wheelchairs, you know. And uh, the power of God was just moving. And uh, the people I took over there was just it, it was shocked. They were overwhelmed because they see something on TV is one thing, 
and uh, see it in real life. And yet there's people that will sit there and they will fold their hands and say, oh, they're just a bunch of actors. I mean, how dumb can a person be to say that? You know, I mean, that is a, the height of stupidity. And to make a long story short, I'm in there listening, and I hear all this noise in the background. So I go up the steps, thousands of the people, and I go through the doors, and I go, I wonder what, what's going on. And then I see these four, five, eight, nine guys carrying this woman out of a bed that an ambulance pulled up to the door and they were taking her out on this bed. And she, and she looked like she was a pretty he heavy set woman. And she was yelling, I don't want to come here. I want to go home. I don't, I don't believe this. And I'm going, oh, this is something. And uh, I walk up there thinking maybe I could help out in case somebody was... Uh, uh, you know, manifesting something or something like that. And I figured, what am I doing? I'm here to watch. Uh, I'm sure Pastor Benny Hinn has hundreds of people that know how to deal with, deal with spiritual warfare and stuff like that. And this wasn't a spiritual warfare situation. This was a woman just yelling and screaming, you know, about not wanting to be there in the first place. Yes. Saying she didn't believe. So they take her in the back door and they're taking her down the flight of steps. So then she decided to be quiet because, you know, you're looking around and there's <laughs> 10 or 15,000 people looking at you. Yes. So she set her down. Might have been all her sons and husband, and relatives or whatever. And then the line's moving up, you know, and people's getting healed. And uh, I figure, boy, this is something. Now, I had the privilege of seeing her get out of the ambulance yelling and screaming. So when they get to the front, Benny Hand's walking back and forth praying for, for people. And this woman, they, they help her up out of the bed and she starts to walk around. Well, she hasn't even got to the, to the stage yet. So Benny Hand didn't do anything. It was, it was strictly God and the anointing then that's around the front of the stage. So they help her up the steps, which is three or four steps, which I thought was a miracle in itself. Yes. The walk up a flight of steps. And she walked over, Benny Hand turned around and said, well, what do we have here? And one of the guys with the microphone said, this woman has been in bed for 18 years. And here she is tonight walking around. So Benny Hen says, walk across the stage. And she walked across the stage. And she came back and they put the mic in, in her face and said, well, what do you think? And she said, I don't believe this. That's the first word that came out of her mouth. <laughs> now, I do not have the intelligence to figure out why a person would say that. Uh, you know, you gave me an example the other day and, and, and I forgot it already. <laughs> But it's like a, somebody gives you something really nice at Christmas time, and you go, I can't believe this. this is, what was that example you gave? I don't remember. You don't either. remember either? <laughs> oh, we're a good pair of the night. <laughs> it's like you get a gift, and you open it up, and you go, I can't believe I got this gift. And that's what, that's what you wanted all the time, you know. So anyway, um, I thought that was a really amazing. And now you got all these brothers of Jesus looking at all the miracles which he did already to a multitude of people. And uh, so you got these people in verse 12 and saying, well, he, he deceives the people. And verse 13, how bet no man speak openly of him for fear of the Jews. Why were they afraid of the Jews? Because they did not want to get kicked out of the synagogue. Yes, that was a big thing. That was a very big thing. Very big thing. Because if you get kicked out of the synagogue, um, that means you can't associate with people. You can't go in a grocery store and talk talk to people. You must have just move out of the whole country, because uh, you know that that is uh, extremely uh, 
uh, bad. It's like uh, if I could pick something up in uh, chapter 9, which we haven't got to yet. Uh, chapter 9. Uh, well, chapter 9 is about that blind man, and he got his eyes open. And uh, there's a part in there where they bring the parents in. I think it's chapter 9, verse 23. Therefore, his parents, he is of age, ask him. Yes. So, you know, the parents say, well, ask him. Well, yes. Then again, they called they, the man that was blind, and said unto him, Give God the praise. We know that this man is a sinner. He answered and said, Whether he be a sinner or not, we do not know. Uh, well, the thing is, um, it's not the verse I'm, I'm looking for. Uh, the parents said he's of age, which is basically... Uh, 23. Yeah, but I'm looking for something where, why the parents said he's of age, you know, ask him. In other words, this guy's own mother and father didn't want to get kicked out of the synagogue. Well... Even though he, their own son got his got their eyes got his eyes open, so that was some of the stuff we will get into in the future. But uh, uh, there's a lot of uh, political and religious um, uh, pressure. Yes. I don't know any other way to say it. Anyway, um, we do this way. Do everything we do, we do this way, and we don't veer off. We don't do anything different. We got to have three songs. We got to have a prayer. We got to have a sermon. Right. There's no room for any change in worship habits, and yet we should worship God freely, and we shouldn't be bound by three songs and a sermon. You know. Right. It's like Not there's nothing wrong with that. No, there's nothing wrong with that. But it's like nothing. saying to the Holy Spirit, "Now you're welcome in this place, but this is what we do. We do this. We take up an offering. We go, and this is that." And uh, you don't see anybody getting healed. You don't see the power of God. And God forgive, forbid that the power of God fell. People would say, well, well what, what's that all about? What's going on? I think sometimes people are afraid of the power of God. And we shouldn't be because uh, we want to spend eternity with God after all. And we should uh, be thankful for what he does and expect more miracles and more good things to happen. I found if you don't put God in a box, the church service is so much greater than just going in empty and coming out empty. That's you know right. what I mean? So anyway, um, let me back up to verse 14. Now about the midst of the feast, it's about in the middle of it, Jesus went up into the temple and toured. So it's not like he's afraid. No. He waited to the middle of the feast, so it was pretty crowded. It's not as crowded as it will be uh, in verse 37. That's when the end of the feast is there. Why is it crowded now? Because people are coming in from all over the known area for the, the time of a... Of a the feast is called the Feast of uh, Tabernacles in verse 2. Now the Jews' Feast of Tabernacles was at hand. Uh, let me try to mark my spot there in verse 14 and say that, uh, and, and you help me out here, Beverly. Uh, there's the, f and I won't uh, elaborate too deep on any of this, but th there's the Feast of, the, of Passover, and then there's the feast of a uh, uh, Pentecost, and then there's this uh, the the feast of Tabernacle, and there's many many uh, little feasts here and there, but mainly the 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 feast of Passover was to celebrate the time when the death angel passed by the the door when they were in in Egypt. Yes. And they, they put the blood. They the put the blood the on the on the door on the top of the door and, and the on both sides. Yes. They didn't spill the blood on on the ground. No. They were very careful to put it on the three spots, 
and uh, what they were really doing was p making a, a, a picture or image of the three crosses on the hill. Yes. You know, and uh, what they didn't realize was that um, they were inside with the door closed and they were eating the sacrificial lamb. Well, you remember in the book of John chapter 1, verse 29, what does John the Baptist say? He say, he said, Behold, the Lamb of God, that come take away the sins of the world. Now, uh, I'm trying to, yeah, then the next day John seeth Jesus come unto him and said, Behold, the Lamb of God, which take away the sins of the world. Remember, he said the sins of the world. He didn't say the sins of Israel. No. He said the sins of the world. So when Jesus said, "If when the Son of Man is lifted up, speaking of himself, he said, I will draw all men unto himself. So then we did a, a brief understanding that when they left uh, Egypt and went into the wilderness, uh, that represents the the Passover uh, mm -hmm. of the death angel, yes. where they were they were celebrating their freedom from bondage, their freedom from Egypt, their freedom from slavery. Now I won't go into a lot of details because I'm trying to get through the Book of John, but then we have uh, the day of, of Pentecost, which is uh, it's 50 days after the, after the the day of uh, Passover. That's right. And the day of Pentecost, of course we know that in the New Testament, where uh, that was the day that the Holy Spirit fell down upon the people. In fact, those two things was uh, in Acts chapter 1, verse 5. It says, For John truly baptized with water, but ye shall be baptized with the Holy Ghost not many days hence. So here's uh, Jesus talking about uh, the Holy Spirit that will be coming down. And in verse 8, But ye shall receive power after that of the Holy Ghost which comes upon you, and ye shall be witnesses unto me both in Jerusalem and in Judea and Samaritan and the othermost parts of the earth. And if you make a study at home about that, about this, you can find that in chapter 2, it says, verse 1, and when the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. And suddenly there came a sound from heaven as a rushing mighty wind, and it filled the house where they were sitting. And there appeared unto them cloven tongues like a fire, as a fire. And, they, and it set upon each of them, and they, be, they were all filled with the Holy Ghost, and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. Now we could teach on this for a couple of hours, but it came from heaven. The, the power fell from heaven. It wasn't from a man or denomination or nothing. It fell upon whoever was there to receive it. And anybody can receive the Holy Spirit. You just have to ask for it, believe, and receive. Okay, let's go back to the book of John chapter 7 um, verse 15 the Jews marveled saying how knoweth this man letters having never learned this is kind of funny Jesus answered them and said my doctrine is not mine but his that sent me which is you know, his father right Verse 17, if any man will do his will, he shall know of the doctrine, whether it be of God or whether I speak of myself. So you can tell, really, you and I can tell, if a man's speaking the word of God or if he's speaking his own will That's or his right. own flesh. That's right. Uh, uh, people got to be very, very careful uh, of this because... Uh, when someone speaks representing Jesus, uh, they're representing God. And they, they need to be in the spirit. They don't need to be in the flesh. Uh, 
I think some famous evangelist said one time there's a difference between prophesying and prophet lying. And there is. There is. And prophet lying is getting in the flesh and saying something because what you feel could be that you're speaking f from God and maybe it's not from God. So what you need to do is ask the Holy Spirit. Uh, when somebody tells you something, do this or do that or whatever. I always say, in any teaching I may give to somebody, ask that person, which book is it in? Which chapter is it in? And which verse is it in? I do too. Because a lot of people walk around and say, well, so-and-so said I should go do this or sell my house or go to this country, go there, go there. They need to ask God for direction. Absolutely. And the Holy Spirit will guide you into all truth. That's what the Bible says. Amen. It doesn't mean that uh, there, I, I spoke about the counterfeit, you know. There is a real uh, anointing upon people when they do uh, prophesy representing God. But don't be confused with that which is uh, in the flesh. And I think if you walk with God long enough, you can almost sit in the back of a church and look at the difference. That's right. Because you can tell right away. So what do you do in that case? You just pray for people and uplift them and ask God to bless them. But, you know, you have to really watch what you say when you're representing people. Now, Jesus is representing his Father. And he's only going to say the words that his Father told him to say. And in verse 18, He that speaketh of himself seeketh his own glory. But he that seeketh his glory that sent him the same is true, and no unrighteousness is in him. So that's what Jesus is saying. There's no unrighteousness in, in what I'm saying, he says, to, to the people. Did not Moses give you the law, and yet none of you keep the law? Why go ye about to kill me? Okay. He, he knows they're trying to kill him because it says up here in verse 1, after these things, Jesus walked in Galilee, for he would not walk in Jewry because the Jews sought to kill him. So right there. And if you go to verse 25, you will see it again. Then said some of them of Jerusalem, It is not this he who they seek to kill. So it was pretty well common that they were out to try to kill Jesus. So what happens in verse um, um, 19? Did not Moses give you the law, and yet none of you keep the law? Why go ye about to kill me? The people answered and said, Thou hast a devil. Who's going about to kill thee? You know, you can't lie to God. No. <laughs> no. I mean, his people trying to spin it away, it's, you know, but you can't spin the news that's already in the heart of God because God already knows what's going to happen. He knows the number of hairs on their head, you know. Jesus answered and said unto them, I have done one work, and you, ye all marveled. Now, what was that one work? He's referring to what happened in John chapter 5, remember? Yes. But the man getting up, who was crippled for 38 years. And he goes on to say, Moses therefore had given you your circumc you circumcision, not because it was from Moses, but of the Father. And ye on the Sabbath day circumcise a man. So this is what we already said a while back, 10 minutes ago or so, that it was a good thing to circumcise a young child on the eighth day. And... Uh, you know, scientists, I believe, in 1969, uh, 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 the medical profession, discovered that the blood kind of coagulates. Is that the right word? Coagulates, At, at yes. that, that particular time. Yes. And that's the best time to circumcise a young male baby. Uh, and it's funny. That's what God already figured out a long time ago. 
<laughs> well, God made us. He know us, knows how he made us. Right. He knows, <laughs> he knows exactly. what's inside of us. <laughs> right. So uh, he knows when the, the circumcision should be done on a man. Now, verse 23. If a man on the Sabbath day receives circumcision, that the law of Moses shall not be broken, are you angry with angry at me because I have made a man every whit whole on the Sabbath day? In other words, made a man healthy on the on the Sabbath day, or made a man well. Remember all the the repercussions that took place in chapter five uh, when Jesus healed the man. And he goes on to say in verse 24, Judge not according to the appearance, but judge righteous judgment. I think the, the New King James says, don't, st st don't judge by the, judge, judge not according to the flesh, but, but judge by the, verse 24. I don't know, uh, 24. Just, just check. Oh. 24. Do you see 24 there? It, do not judge according to appearance, but judge with righteous judgment. Righteous judgment. Okay. Now verse 25. Then said some of them of Jerusalem, Is not this he who they seek to kill? Now, here it's coming out. Remember in verse 19, it talked about killing Jesus. Remember in verse 20, it talked about killing Jesus. Remember in verse 1, it was common knowledge that the Jews were trying to kill Jesus. And here's verse 25, to back up everything that I was sharing with you about the fact that they were trying to seek Jesus to kill him. But lo, he speaketh boldly, and they, they say nothing unto him. So here's the Jewish people the people that's in the, in in the on the streets, wondering what's going on, and they ask the question: Do the rulers know indeed that this is a very Christ? In other words, did they come to make a decision? Yes. That this really was, or this really is the Messiah? Well, no. They they they're so spiritually blind, they can't see. If they really studied the scriptures. Um, they, they would they would know that all of the Old Testament talked about the coming of Jesus Christ. Yes. Um, yes. Do you happen to? Uh, would you turn to? Oh, let me get one that's pretty well. Oh, there's so many of them going through my mind. Look, look at Psalms chapter 22. I know this is a little bit uh, off the subject. Psalms chapter 22. 22 what? Well, verse 1, is just, just read that. 22 1. My God, my God. Okay, why? okay, stop right here. This is Psalms 22. This is 700 years before crucifixion was ever, ever invented. It was invented by, I think, the Syrians or something, and the Jews, not the Jews, but the Romans, perfected it better. If I, I don't, don't want to use the word better, but they made it in such a way that a, a, a victim would take longer to die. It caused more pain. It caused more pain. Uh, and, uh, but when, when you look at what the words, what Jesus said when he was hanging on the cross, my God, my God, why has thou forsaken me? And we will go into that uh, a little bit deeper because God, even God the Father, could not look upon uh, sin. sin. Not that Jesus was sinning, but he took sin upon himself. He took our sins on Took him. our sins upon himself and uh, paid the price for all of us. But if you could read uh, a little bit of Psalms, not the whole thing, but just to get the idea, and as my wife is reading this, uh, do it nice and loud. Uh, think of Jesus hanging on the cross. My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Why art thou so, thou so far from helping me and from the words of my roaring? 
oh my God, I cry in the daytime, and thou hearest not, and in the night season, and am not silent. But thou art holy, O thou that inhabitest the praises of Israel. Our fathers trusted in thee. They trusted, and you did deliver them. They cried unto thee, and were delivered. They trusted in you, and they were not confounded. But I am a worm, and no man, a reproach of men, and despised of the people. All they that see me laugh me to scorn. They shoot out the lip, they shake the head, saying, He trusted on the Lord that he would deliver him. Let him deliver him, seeing he delights in him. But thou art he that took me out of the womb. Thou didst make me hope when I was upon my mother's breast. I was cast upon thee from the womb. Thou art my God from my mother's belly. Be not far from me, for trouble is near, for there is none to help. Many bulls have compassed me. Strong bulls of Bashan have beset me round. They gaped upon me with their mouths as a ravening and roaring lion. I am poured out like water, and all my bones are out of joint. My heart is like wax, it is melted in the midst of my bowels. My strength is dried up like a potsherd. My tongue cleaveth to my jaws, and thou hast brought me into the dust of death. For dogs have compassed me, the assembly of the wicked have enclosed me. They pierced my hands and my feet. I may tell all my bones, they look and stare upon me. They part my garments among them and they cast lots upon my vesture. Be not thou far from me, O Lord, O my strength, haste thee to help me. Deliver my soul from the sword, and my darling from the power of the dog. Save me from the lion's mouth, for thou hast heard me from the horns of the unicorns. Could you stop right there? I can. Yeah, and if the people could read that at home, in your private uh, devotion, you would see that's one example, there's many examples, that I will give you when, before this course is over, how the, the foretelling of Jesus. Now that talks about his bones being out of place. Yes. His mouth being dried. Mm -hmm. The medical profession will tell you, to or testify, that this is a, a picture of someone dying on the cross. Yes. Because you literally are suffocating and you're literally drowning within your own blood. And, uh, you're, you're suffocating because uh, you can't get any air. And you have to push down on the spike to raise yourself up to get air. But we will go in more into that detail of that coming up in weeks and weeks and weeks to come. But right now, we're on verse 25. Let me back up to 25. Then said some of them of Jerusalem, Is not th this he whom they seek to kill? But lo, he speaks boldly, and they say nothing unto him. Do the rulers know, indeed, that this is a very Christ? How bet we know this man, whence he is? But when Christ comes, no man knows where he is. So what you're saying is, and I may break it down in regular English, uh, do you have this verse in the, in the, this Bible here? Oh. Do you want to break for about 10 seconds? Yeah, is it well now? Yeah. We're going to break for 10 seconds right now and come back to this, okay? Get your verse. This one you want? What are you looking up? You were looking up at the verse first. Okay, here we are back again. Um, we took a break for 10 seconds here. <laughs> and uh, we were on verse um, 24? Oh, 25. 25. And some of them at Jerusalem is not this he who they seek to kill. Okay, we said this now. Uh, verse 26, that they, they question about the fact that he speaks boldly, and they wonder if, if the rulers, I mean the rulers themselves knew that this was the very Christ. 
And uh, but no man is saying no. Oh, here's a verse I want to explain. Verse 27. How bet we know this man whence he is? But when Christ comes, no man knows where he is. Can you read that in this Bible here, verse 27, to get a clearer understanding of what what he's saying? Chapter 7, verse 27. Chapter 7, verse 27. However, we know when this, where this man is from. But when the Christ comes, no one knows where he is from. I thought that might be a little bit easier to understand. And in verse 28, Then cried Jesus in the temple as he taught, saying, Ye both know me, and ye know whence I am. And I am not come of myself, but he that sent me is true whom ye know not. So he's saying to them that you don't even know God or know my Father. Now, he goes on to say in verse 29, But I know him, for I am from him, and he has sent me. Then they sought to take him, but no man laid hands on him, because his hour was not yet come. Now, there's so much stuff in this Bible to teach about this particular chapter. Uh, They didn't lay hands on him because his hour was not yet come. Now, you remember back in chapter 2, and I will just uh, skim over this. Remember when he went to the wedding feast? Yes. And uh, remember uh, uh, the wedding feast, it was the third day, and Jesus went to the marriage in Canaan of Galilee, and the mother of Jesus was there, and both Jesus was calling his disciples to the marriage. And when they wanted wine, the mother of Jesus said unto him, They have no wine. And Jesus said unto her, Woman, what have I to do with thee? My hour is not yet come. So keep that in mind. He was on a divine time schedule. In chapter 7, verse 30, which we haven't got to yet. Um, Well, we're there right now. Chapter 7, verse 30, he talks about that hour. And in chapter 8, verse 20, he talks about the time they were going to stone him. But they could not do it because his hour was not yet come. And then, of course, chapter 12, verse 23, it came up again about possibly persecuting Jesus, but his hour was not yet come. Uh, Just for the sake of it, could you read chapter 8, verse 20? Chapter 8. 8, verse 20. Yeah. These words spake Jesus in the treasury as he taught in the temple, and no man laid hands on him. For his hour was not yet come. Amen. Now, what about chapter 12, verse 23? I don't want people just to take my word for it. I want them to actually see it in their own Bible. Chapter 12, verse 23. Chapter 12, verse 23, if you're following along. And Jesus answered them, saying, The hour is come that the Son of Man should be glorified. Right. Now, in chapter 17, this is verse 1. This is Jesus actually praying to the Father. It's chapter 17, verse 1. These these words spake Jesus and lifted up his eyes to heaven and said, Father, the hour is come. Glorify thy Son, that thy Son also may glorify thee. Okay, now, in your private study... From the time of Jesus turned the water into wine, saying to his mother, Woman, my hour is not yet come to all these other verses I just gave you, up until chapter 17, verse 1. There was a divine time schedule that Jesus was on. He was not subject to man's time schedule. Even when when Lazarus uh, was dead, for four days he was in the ground, Jesus went there according to his time schedule. There was reasons for that. We haven't got to it yet. But when we get there, I will explain why it took him four days to get there and why he chose 
to hold back. Now verse 30 we just talked about that his hour was not yet come. Verse 31, And many of the people believed on him and said, When Christ comes, will he do more miracles than these which this man has done? That's a good question. That's what the people are asking. Really? Not all the people, but some of the people. Some of the people. The, the Pharisees heard that the people murmuring such things concerning him, and the Pharisees and the chief priests sent officers to take him. In other words, to arrest him. Yes. To bring him for trial. But this is not in the in the plan of God. Because see, he had a woman to to forgive who was caught in the act of adultery. He had a blind man to open up his eyes. He had explained to his disciples about himself being the good shepherd and what sheep are supposed to do, which you and I are sheep. Uh, <laughs> believe it or not, that may be a shock to you, but sheep are not very smart animals. So we need to listen to what the Word of God has to say. And of course, we have chapter 11, Lazarus ris risen from the dead. We have chapter 12, with this woman named Mary, who was a sister of uh, Martha. Martha and Mary were the uh, sisters of Lazarus. Uh, Mary's not to be confused with Mary, who is the mother of, uh, of Jesus, which is a Virgin Mary. This Mary, who was a sister of Martha, is not to be confused with uh, Magdalene, you know, Mary Magdalene, who had the seven demons cast out. She's not to be confused with the other Mary that was in in, um, in Luke chapter 7 who anointed Jesus' feet uh, with, uh, with perfume uh, and that was in uh, the she, she anointed his feet in Luke chapter 7 and uh, uh, she did that, and uh, this was in uh, the house of uh, the Pharisees. Uh, that would be uh, in chapter 7, verse uh, 36. And one of the Pharisees desiring him that he would eat with him. And it goes down, 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 okay, in verse 27. And behold, a woman in the city, which was a sinner, and she knew that Jesus sat at meat at the Pharisee's house. And then, to break it down to you in, in speedy words, uh, she anointed his feet, and the, the Pharisee said, well, this man, Jesus, if he knew what kind of woman this was, uh, he wouldn't let her touch his feet, you know, if he truly was a, a, a prophet or a man from God. And, uh, you can find that when you go home and read it tonight in verse uh, 39. And now the Pharisees, which had her, uh, bidden him, saw it. And he spoke within himself, saying, This man, if he were a prophet, would not have known who and what manner of woman this was who touched him, for he, for she is a sinner. Now, this is Simon the, the Pharisee. This is not to be confused, and some historical people say uh, that this woman's name was Mary also. This is not to be confused with, with Mary, who is a sister of Margaret. Martha. Who, oh, Margaret, right? Martha. Martha, right. Who also washed Jesus' feet in chapter 12. Um, in chapter 12, uh, this woman is the woman which is uh, Mary, who uh, was the sister of Martha, right? And this Mary washed Jesus' feet in uh, the house which was Simon the, the leopard, leopard, who happened to be named Simon too, which has nothing to do with Simon Peter because his name was Simon, too. I am sure I got everybody mixed up at this point. <laughs> so let's get back to the book of John. <laughs> what a rabbit trail. So here we are on verse what? 
Okay, the Pharisees, see, and uh, um, okay, they sent officers in verse 32. The Pharisees heard that the people were moaning uh, such things concerning him, and the Pharisees and the chief priests sent officers to take him. Then said Jesus unto them, Yet a little while am I with you. And then I go unto him that sent me. Ye shall seek me, and shall not find me. And where I am, there ye cannot come. Is that what it says? That's what my Bible says. That you cannot come? Yes. So who's he talking to? He's talking to people, which is the scribes and Pharisees, who do not believe in him. So he's saying that where I am going... You cannot come. Yes. Now, let me show you something. Keep that in mind. And if you're taking notes, uh, look at chapter 14. Here's Jesus. He's not talking to the, to the scribes and Pharisees, or the Pharisees and the, and the Sadducees. He's not talking to them. In chapter 14, verse 1, he's talking to his disciples. And I want to show you something here. It says, Let not your hearts be troubled. Ye believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it was not so, I would not have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there ye may be also. So he's saying to the believers that you are going to be with me someday. Over here, he's saying to the non-believers, you can't follow me. You're not going to be with me. Yes. Now that is something to think about if you haven't learned nothing else tonight. Think about that. Dwell on the fact that uh, Jesus said, you know, if you believe on me, you're going to be with me for eternity. But if you don't believe, you're not going to be with me at all. And the other place is hell. And uh, people can say, well, there's no such thing as, as hell. You know, the Bible talks a lot about hell. Yes. Almost more about hell than it does about heaven. So look it up on your, on your, in your computer about how many times they talk about hell and stuff like that. So anyway, we have a uh, verse 33 and verse 34 says you cannot come where I am at. Verse 35, then said the Jews among themselves, uh, where will he go that we should not find him? Will he go unto the disperse among the Gentiles and teach the Gentiles? In other words, is, is he going to go away some other place? They're thinking in a physical sense. They're thinking that he's going to change his geographical location yes. or go preach to another group of people in some other town or a different country. You know, And they're not quite sure. And what man is saying is this, that he says, he shall seek me, you shall seek me and not find me. And where I am, hither ye cannot come. Okay. This verse I really like. In the last days, now this is the verse where all the people from all over Israel and all over the surrounding countries who believe in Judaism, who are coming together for the feast of what? Of tabernacles. Tabernacles in, is verse 2. Then the Jews' feast of tabernacles was at hand. Oh, I forgot to mention, tabernacles is when they were out in the desert uh, and they built these little booths, right? That's right. And they were made out of straw and leaves. And I'm supposed if I had more time, I could uh, explain it better. But they, they went in there and they, they, they kind of camped out in there, you know. Yes. Uh, and it was a celebration of the, of the remembrance 
of them being out in the desert after they have been delivered from the Egyptians um, uh, out of slavery. That's true. That's true. So they were celebrating that, and this feast was the celebration of that. Now, let me back up uh, on verse 20, 37, which you have to find out, it doesn't say in the Bible, but in study notes and commentaries, there was a, a, a ritual where they took a golden uh, pitcher, correct me if I'm wrong, a golden pitcher, and they took the water out of the, the pool of Siloam, right? And they took it up there, and they would pour it down a little bit in kind of a ritual way, you know, to demonstrate the water that came out of the rock in, in the desert where Moses was supposed to speak to the rock. But you remember, he hit the rock. And he did something that God asked him not to do. Now, you can read all about that uh, later on in your private devotion, but they were celebrating that water by dumping that water, you know, to celebrate the water that came out of the rock. But it was it's physical water. Mm -hmm. You drink it, and you're still thirsty again. Of course. Like the woman at the well, remember? He said to her, the water that I give you, you will never thirst again. And remember, she said, give me this water so I would not have to come to this well anymore. Well, she uh, was talking about a physical water, and he was talking about a spiritual water. So uh, right in the middle of pouring this water out, which doesn't exactly say this, unless you study out in your commentaries or strong concordance, uh, what this all means, you will find in verse 27, in the last day, what does that mean? The last day of the feast. Verse 37. 37. In the last day, that great day of the feast, which is the big day, Jesus stood and cried, saying, and this doesn't mean he's crying, it means he's, he's uh, talking, loudly. talking loudly. He's speaking up, you know. Uh, if any man thirsts, let him come unto me and drink. Now, he is quoting something which is in Isaiah chapter 55 verse 1. Uh, if you want to look up that to make sure uh, I'm right, I'm sorry about jumping all over the Bible tonight. Isaiah 51 verse 1. And it goes on to say in verse 38, He that believeth on me, as the scriptures have said, out of his, out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water. Do you have Isaiah? Of Isaiah, are you sure it's 51? 51 verse 1. Hearken to me, you that follow after righteousness. Am I saying 51? Yeah. I'm sorry, 55. I thought it was something else. It's <laughs> 55 in my head. It coming out of my mouth is 51. It's 55. Ho, oh, everyone that is thir that thirsteth, come ye to the waters, and he that hath no money, come you, buy and eat. Yea, come buy wine and milk without money and without price. Okay, there's a cross-reference of what he's talking about when he says, He that believeth on me, as the scriptures have said, out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water. Now, let me say this. Uh, in, the, in, the, in the New King James, and uh, it says, out of the heart shall flow rivers of living water. Did you know in the, in the Jewish culture, uh, they looked upon the heart as coming out of the belly. Yes. Did you ever hear the expression, I have a gut feeling about this situation? Yes. That's what the, when the Jewish people say that, they understand what they're saying. It's a gut feeling that, uh, that um, how am I doing on time? Oh, you're fine. Okay, they have a gut feeling, which means it comes from, from their, their, their stomach. So it says, he that believeth on me, as the scriptures have said, out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water. But in verse 39, but this he spoke, he of the Spirit, which they that believe on him shall receive. 
for the Holy Ghost was not yet given because that Jesus was not yet glorified. That means he didn't go to the cross yet. That's right. Because you, when you're glorified, that means you die on the cross. Yeah. And in case there's people out there that, that don't know this, and I don't know who I'm talking to, but to be sanctified, uh, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's like being separated from the world. We're in the world, but, but we're not of the world. Mm-hmm. So we're sanctified, we're, we're, we're set apart from the world. Now to be justified, which is a short word for justification, which means uh, justified by having faith in God, you become righteous. Just as if I just, never sinned. Just as if you never sinned. Mm-hmm. Now this is so no. difficult for somebody in prison to understand this because you say when you have faith in God, you are just as much of a righteous person as myself or Beverly, That's right. or Billy Graham, or Benny Hinn, or Kreplo Dollar, or Joyce Myers, or the list can go on and on and on. Well, Bill, in ourselves, none of us are righteous or holy. It's Jesus' blood that makes us righteous, and we're it, all the same. It, it's the blood of Jesus Christ that, that, that we can all stand before God. Yes. And, and when you talk to people like in a prison setting, and you, you tell this to them, and they and they always come up with, well, but uh, I don't want to go into it, but I did this and this and this. How can God forgive me of this? Well, if you accept God, and you become born again, you have to accept His forgiveness. That's right. And the verse that I give them, which. Uh, they kind of scratched their head about, and that is First John back here. You probably know if you're a Bible student where I'm going to. First John, uh, chapter one in the First John chapter one verse nine. Are you there? Almost. Almost. I, page. I got notes in my Bible, and I turn the pages. Okay, down. it's First John, chapter one. Verse 9. Uh, it says, If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So the word all in the Greek or, or the Hebrew is still all. It's every single every, one. Every sin. So the devil will come along in your mind. And he will say, but he can't forgive this. Look what you did in the dark or what you did and this and that. And uh, uh, the blood of Jesus covers everything. Now, I have met people uh, in a prison setting that would say, well, surely he can't forgive this and this. I said, I didn't want to know what this and this is. I don't want to know. It's none of my business. And they they find it so difficult to 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 uh, comprehend that, and uh, but once they become uh, and they know that they're righteous, uh, they they make a statement that the world can't understand, and that is, I'm in prison, but I'm free. <laughs> and I look at them and go, you got it. That's right. They have you're in prison and you're getting out in three or four months or whatever the case may be, but you're free right now. That's right. And we met a lot of people that were free. That's right. And they just wanted to get home and and just tell their loved ones about this new freedom they found. And uh, I just thank God that he, he used you and I in that season to uh, minister to people. What what an honor and blessing that was to have people uh, trust us and say, come on in and teach, just like the people here. Just like Pastor Dave Adams is trusting us to come here and teach the Word of God. What, What a blessing that is. And it goes on in verse 39, it says that, uh, 
And as he spoke, he of the Spirit, which they that believe on him shall receive. For the Holy Ghost was not yet given, because that Jesus was not yet glorified. And many of the people, therefore, when they heard this saying, said, Of a truth, this is the prophet. So, some people believe that this is the prophet that Moses talked about. Remember when Moses talked about that there would be a great prophet that will be risen up, you know, and uh, those uh, uh, rabbis who made an intense study of the Word of God realized that Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and Moses, and, and all of them talked about this great prophet that would come up in the future. Well, this is the one they're talking about. This is called Jesus Christ. And he's the one that everyone is talking about. In fact, if my my memory serves me right, uh, um, 41, uh, I think it's found in, uh, well, see, uh, 40, what does it take 40? Uh, 40 uh, in, in Deuteronomy chapter 18, verse 15 could possibly be be one uh you better check that check check up on me on that one deuteronomy chapter 18 verse 15. deuteronomy is in the front of the book in front of the bible okay did you get the deuteronomy no i still have numbers you in Numbers. I mean Deut Deuteronomy what? Deut Deuteronomy chapter uh, uh, 18 verse 15. Chapter 18 verse 15. What's that say? For these nations which thou shalt possess hearkened unto observers of times and unto diviners. But as for thee, the Lord thy God has not suffered thee so to do. 1814. No, 1815. 1850. The Lord thy God will praise up unto thee a prophet from the midst of thee, of thy brethren like unto me. Unto him you shall hearken. Okay, read that a little bit slower and louder. The Lord thy God will raise up unto thee a prophet from the midst of thee, of thy brethren like unto me. Unto him you shall hearken. Okay, a prophet. Remember Jesus said, now Jesus had many offices. Uh, Jesus said one time, that a prophet has no honor in his own country. That's what, right? That, yes, that's what I remember said. several weeks back in time, I shared with everybody who's watching, and I don't know how many people's watching, that Jesus uh, had many offices. Uh, true that he was the king of kings, you know, and true he was uh, the, the son of man, and true he was a suff suffering savior, and true he was the son of God. Now, uh, in order to get a full understanding of the scriptures as you read them, you have to ask the Holy Spirit to help you to understand what office Jesus is in at the time. For example, to give you a minor one, when he sat on the well and said to the woman in chapter 4, I thirst, he says he was thirsty. See, he was a man. He, he was... He was um, manifesting the characteristics of a man. Remember when Lazarus was dead, it says Jesus wept. It's the characteristics of a man. That's right. You know, uh, when, when Jesus ate food, this is the characteristics of, of, uh, of a man. Some people who don't read the Bible got this uh, fantasy that he just was walking around two inches off the ground with a halo around here. No, he was a man, flesh and blood, who walked among us. And uh, it said um, in the scriptures that we beheld his glory, the glory of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. So here is Jesus walking around in, in different offices. Now, it says in verse 40, Another truth, this is the prophet. 
Now, let me go take this rabbit trail a little bit deeper. <clears throat> when he was here, true, he was under many offices, uh, many manifestations. But let's just take the word prophet. Here he was a, a prophet. And then after the crucifixion of the cross, he went up into heaven and Paul declares him as the high priest. Why? Because he's interceding for us. But when he comes back <clears throat> in the book of, uh, <coughs> of Revelation, chapter 19, he's coming back as the king of kings. He's come back as the lion of the tribe of Judah. That's right. He come back as a lion. So he went from a prophet on this earth to heaven as the high priest coming back as a conquering king. Now, when he comes back as a king, remember the first time when he walked on this earth, what did John say? Behold the Lamb of God that come take away the sins of the world. You know what? This is good teaching. <laughs> we should look at this. If it wasn't for my face, I might be interested in <laughs> looking at this. But I look at it, I go, boy, that guy looks bad, <laughs> you know. But do um, you have anything to say about what's going on? Yeah, let's get back to the scripture. <laughs> let's get back to the scriptures. That's a good word. Okay. So we got the word prophet nailed down pretty good. 41. Others said, this is the Christ, which is to say, this is the anointed one. But some said, Shall Christ come out of Galilee? Well, we all know that. If you look in the scriptures, the scriptures tell us that. Has not the scriptures said that Christ comes of the seed of David and out of the town of Bethlehem, where David was born? Remember where Jesus was born? In Bethlehem. Yes, he was, but they didn't realize that at that time. They didn't realize it at that time, so I'm not putting these people down. They just didn't. See, we have the Bible all completed, and yes. uh, we're, we're reading the, the whole thing 2,000 years later. But they were living it and didn't even know it. They were living it and didn't even know it. Pray, pray for me, Beverly. I'm losing my voice. <laughs> and uh, the thing is, uh, he was from the town of Bethlehem. It's a fact. Definitely from the, from the David uh, was from King David. So there was a division among the people because of him, and some of them would have taken him, but no man laid hands on him. Then came the officers. Remember the officers that the chief priest sent? Mm -hmm. Then the officers, then came the officers to the chief priests and the Pharisees, and they said unto him, why have you not brought him? <laughs> this is a good whoa. This is a good uh, question. I mean, we sent you out to pick him up. Why didn't and you? And you come back empty-handed. <laughs> I mean, what what is the problem here? So then answered them, the Pharisees, are you also? Oh, see you. Oh, no, I'm sorry. Verse 46. The officers answered, neither man spake like this man. In other words... They were just dumbfounded the way Jesus was speaking. I mean, this is something that they had a job to do. But when they got there, they went, wow, no one speaks like this, like this yeah. Jesus. And uh, he is different. So the question is, has any of the rulers? Oh, oh I'm sorry. 47. Then answered them, the Pharisees, Are you also deceived? Have any of the rulers or of the Pharisees believed on him? So they're asking each other, Does any, anybody believe that this Jesus is truly the Messiah? But this people who knows not the law are cursed. In other words, the, the common people who believe uh, that maybe Jesus is the Messiah, they're saying, well, these people, these uneducated people, are actually cursed. They don't even know what they're talking about, you know. Isn't it funny how uh, 
your relationship with God is not uh, it's not uh, not your education it's not uh, yeah it's not in other words it's not dependent upon whether or not you have a high school degree or a college degree to get into heaven no those aren't even involved the most fascinating the most deepest people I've ever met uh, in my life only had a third or fourth or fifth grade education but they were taught by the Holy Spirit and the Holy Spirit does teach us what we need to know amen and it's not to say that uh, if you have a great education that, that God can't use you no that's a good thing um, it says here has any of the rulers or of the Pharisees believed on him but this people who know not the law or curse. Nicodemus, you remember him in chapter 3? Nicodemus said unto them, He that came to Jesus by night, being one of them, remember, being one of them, Nicodemus was the leader of the, of the Jews, a Pharisee. Mm -hmm. That's in chapter 3, verse 1. Does our law judge any man before it hears him and knows what he does? That's a good question. And, and the question is, no, that the law does not judge a man no. without hearing him. No. But they just did not want to hear him because of what? Jealousy? Envy? It was going to mess up their religion and mess up their position uh, that they had going, which was kind of like a country within a country. Yes. Because the bigger country was the Roman Empire. They were in the middle, you know. So it's, it's, it's 42. Then answered and said unto them, th they answered and said unto him, Are thou also a Galilean? Search and look, for out of Galilee arises no prophet. Now that statement is wrong because there's been four minor prophets that came out of Galilee and every man went unto his own house so the discussion is over and they are left now let me get back to uh, I, I think we have a few minutes left let me get back to this 37 verse 37 in the last day that great day of the feast Jesus stood and cried, saying, If any man thirst, let him come unto me and drink. He that believeth in me, as the scriptures have said, out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water. It goes on to say in verse 39, But this, this he spake of the Spirit, which they have, which that believe on him shall receive. For the Holy Ghost was not yet given, because that Jesus was not yet glorified. When we get into chapter 16, we will talk about this person called the Holy Ghost, which is a th third person of the Trinity. And let me just sum up this particular teaching by saying in chapter 16, uh, verse 12. Well, this whole chapter 16, you can read it when we go off the air. He's explaining about the Holy Spirit and who he is. Now, it would naturally take weeks to explain everything the Holy Spirit does inside of a person. But in verse 12, I have yet many things to say to you, but ye cannot bear them now. How bit when he, you know, it says he, the Holy Spirit's not an it, it's a he. He's a third person of the Trinity. He, the Spirit of truth, is come he will guide you into all truth for he shall not speak of himself but whatsoever he shall hear that shall he speak and he will show you things to come this word i use about a gut feeling there are countless billions of people in the world today they look at the news and they got a gut feeling that something's about to happen, something big. I mean, you look at the hurricanes, 
the tw the twisters, wars against uh, rumors against I mean, nation against nation, kingdom against kingdom. You see out of control dictators. You mm -hmm. see what the the problems that Israel is having right now. How they are surrounded right now with people who just hate the Jews. Uh, Jerusalem, uh, Israel, is not is not is not what is wrong with the Middle East. It's what's right with the Middle East. Uh, that has a lot to to be looked at. But I leave you with the words: uh, pray for Israel, because if you're a, a Christian. Uh, all the disciples, everything that came out of out of Israel, everybody was, for the most part, were Jewish. Yes, they were. Even Jesus is king of the Jews. So you, you need to get that in, in your head because he is the vine and we are the branches. We've been adopted into the, into the vine. And uh, the mere fact that we as Christians have been grafted into the vine. Spiritually speaking, if you're a true Christian and you understand the Word of God, we are the children of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And spiritual children. We are spiritual children. We've been grafted into the vine. And uh, we are, we may have different nationalities. <clears throat> we may have different uh, tongues. We may have different colors of skin, but we're all a member of the body of Christ. When we accept Jesus into our heart, we become a member of the body of Christ. How are we doing on time, sir? Uh, you've got another 20 minutes. We do 20 have, minutes? Yeah, we do have a prayer request. Okay. You do? Yeah. You, you want to come up here and, and give that prayer request? Well, we have 20 more minutes. We can pick up some of these uh, nuggets I left behind here. Okay. Oh, boy. And, uh, uh, we got an email uh, from um, uh, Nancy Miller. You know, Randy Miller and Nancy Miller? Oh, yeah. Uh, a tornado <laughs> struck at Massachusetts yesterday. Yes. And uh, three people were killed. And a tree struck in and hit uh, Nancy Miller's two trees struck uh, Nancy Miller's brother's and sister-in-law's home. Oh, no. It didn't, didn't hurt them. Didn't it's hurt the Lord. No, it didn't hurt them. But there were three people struck in uh, Massachusetts uh, because of a tornado that ripped through the city, and uh, three people were killed. And this is Nancy Miller, uh, uh, Randy Miller's? Yes. She's a powerful woman of the Lord. Yeah, so she asked us to pray. Well, we will pray. So we will pray. In fact, let's pray right now. Okay. <clears throat> Lord, we just pray for all of the um, people that have been hit by these uh, massive tornadoes and, and uh, hurricanes. It's been a, a very difficult year for storms here in the U.S. And this latest one, this latest one in Massachusetts, a tornado in Lord, um, there are so many people asking questions because the weather seems so out of control. Lord, we pray for the people that have been, the families of the people who have been killed. Mm -hmm. Lord, we pray that, that they look at this destruction and Lord, they don't see, I pray God that they don't see it as an act of God. Amen. Amen. Because an act of God is not to send tornadoes. Amen. God is a compassionate and loving God, full of grace quick to love. Lord, I pray for the families. Amen. I pray for the people that they will somehow... Lord, I pray for stories of miraculous recoveries. Amen. I pray for stories of God's miraculous covering and intervention of the hand of God protecting people from, from being killed. Mm -hmm. I pray, God, that we'll hear in the news stories of how people should have died, but in fact through miraculous interventions of God and the Holy Spirit, 
they were saved. God, I pray that we see your thumbprint on protection, not on the sending the tornado, but in saving people Amen. who otherwise would, would not have survived had it been not for the protective hand of God covering them. Lord, I pray for um, speedy healing for the people who have been injured. I pray for people in this nation, in this world that are worrying right now Amen. and living in fear because life seems to be so out of control with the economy and the world events. God, we, we believe you are near. We believe Amen. your coming is near. Amen. And I pray for the light to shine and for people to, to embrace the peace that is Jesus Christ so that they do not have to live in fear. Amen. For Jesus said, do not fear, for I am with you always, even to the ends of the earth. I pray for people, our brothers and sisters in Massachusetts. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen. 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 That, is, okay. that is something my, uh, my, uh, my wife's uh, sister back in Alabama, uh, they had a, a large, big, well, they got big trees back there. I mean, not like as tall as we have out here, but they got trees that kind of curve like, and you know. And big trees. Yeah, and I guess uh, one of the, he calls it a branch, uh, Bob and Shirley. Yes, my brother. Yeah, Bob said Mom, that uh, sister. Uh, one of the branches, you know, they trunk like a, a eight inches wide or something, 20 feet long, and it just snapped off in the wind. And it blew past their <laughs> their home and made like a little mark, like a little, like a magic marker mark on the side of the, uh, of, of the of the house where the bedroom was. Really? He said a, an inch either way, uh, it could have ripped out the whole house and broke it in half. You know, and they just looked at it and said, it was like some, un well, I know what it was, I like un it unseen force just grabbed it and said, oh, you're not going to hit that house. <laughs> <laughs> but, it, but you knew it was there because you can see the market left on the yes. side of the house. Yeah. But you know if it was just like six inches more one way or right. the other, that's amazing. Praise God. Yeah. Praise God. And uh, it's like, uh, oh, well, ha do we have about 10 minutes to go? Sure. Well, I don't have the pictures here in front of me, but uh, uh, my, uh, did you want to tell the story about uh, David real quick? No, you tell it. Okay. My wife's grandson. You're a good storyteller. Uh, David. Uh, and uh, who's Crystal. the? Crystal. Crystal. And they were in the house together, and they, they heard some sounds. Uh, I moved around in the kitchen. I kind of streamlined it pretty quick. And they had some dogs in the house. And, uh, and then uh, Crystal heard another sound. David was still sleeping. So she got up there and walked out of the bedroom. And in the kitchen, it was all in flames. The whole house, the, the rooms, everything. So she screamed and got David up. And, uh, and David got up and he started to get the one dog out. And the dog had arthritis. And, it's kind of frozen. I'm trying to streamline this story. And uh, he got the dog out of the house. And then he ran back in. And the place is covered with flames all over the place. And uh, so they got out. And uh, so he went around the other side of, of the, the back part of the house. And there was a, one of his dogs was still in there. So he, he busted the window out. And he was trying to get up to get in. The, and he heard a voice say, uh, dude, don't go in there. Now, this was the man at the time uh, is not exactly going to church every Sunday. And he, he went back like this, like, wh wh what was that? <laughs> well, make a long story short, the whole house burned to the ground. It collapsed. Everything. Like they went through the fire, and the fire department said, if he would have jumped in that window, he would have been dead right away because of the, of the fire coming out through the window. There's no way he could have busted the window and jumped in there to save the dog. Now, it's a shame the dog got killed, but it shows that God loved him more than the dog. 
Now there was, there was nobody around to shout that. Nobody, nobody around to, sh to nobody shout, there. dude, don't go in there. Nobody there. So the fire department says there's no way he could be alive. So then the, they went through the rubble and they found a cookbook that Beverly wrote. And there was her picture on the cover. And in this cookbook was a picture of her holding a pie. And then you turn the page over. And there's the only thing left in the whole place. The and, and there's a picture of her holding a pie. And it says, my recipe for life is serving Jesus Christ. <laughs> right there in the cookbook. Wow. So naturally, uh, they want to get some Bibles. And... Uh, if you like, I can bring those pictures into you someday, but uh, that's that's amazing. That's incredible. It is. So we, we, pr go in there. we pray that uh, mm -hmm. that they're going to church, and because that's a great uh, love that God had for them to, to say, don't do that. Yeah, let's pray for them all the time, too. Oh, you got something to say about all these oh, announcements? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. No, I, I want to talk about that story. <laughs> it's, it's just... Um, you know, when you read stories about this uh, this tornado in Massachusetts, but you, you hear stories about the miraculous intervention of God. Uh, do don't go in there. When yes. Nobody was around to say it. No. And uh, God is still at work. God's hand is still protecting people in, uh, uh, in America and uh, across the world. We don't know why... Everyone isn't saved from death, from you know physical destruction of tornadoes and such. But I know Bill and Beverly, and I know I've heard of, of miraculous stories of the intervention of God. And and you have to look. Remember the story in the Bible where where ten people were saved, and only one came back. Yes. Yeah. And Jesus said, ten people were healed. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry, ten people were healed. Where are the nine? One came back to say thank you to Jesus. And Jesus said, where are the, where are the other nine? Where are the other nine? Yes, where are the nine? Where are the nine? And can I share something for one minute? Sure, you can share something for two minutes if you want. No, I just, I just need a minute to... Sure. The, when he, he healed the ten, uh -huh. there's something there. He says, go, show yourself to the priests, right. which is the law. Uh -huh. The one who came back was a Gentile. He couldn't go with the priests. Look at it real carefully. He was caught between a rock and a hard place. He couldn't go with the priests because he was a Gentile. He would have got kicked out of the synagogue. So he had, come, had to come back to the source and fall down and say, thank you for healing me. But it shows that Jesus loved him so much that even, even though the law... Here we go. <laughs> Here we go. <laughs> Even though the law said that this man is a Gentile and he is not fit to be in the in the synagogue, he was still one of the ten that was healed by Jesus. And he's the only one that came back. The law said that he couldn't go in the synagogue, but the law the the law of love, the the feeling of love made him or compelled him to go back to say thank you. And he was the only one that went back. And he was the, he was the um, Gentile. Mm. And uh, I was talking at lunch with somebody today about um, about the fact that you have access to God. You have access to Jesus. Amen. Um, how do I say this? Jesus said when he commissioned the disciples and he commissioned the believers to go and, and preach the gospel to the world, to uh, raise the dead, cleanse the lepers, set the captives free. Jesus died so that we're not to go into another prison. And sometimes religious rules can be a prison. Sometimes we, we share um, one prison for another or trade one prison for another. And I know, I, I hope I'm making myself clear here. Sometimes you leave the prison of sin but get caught up in this prison of religious rules and get caught into this trap of if you don't follow the rules then God won't heal you. If I don't, if I'm, if I'm good enough, God will heal me. And what happens sometimes is the devil 
lies to you and says, well, you weren't healed because you were bad or you weren't good enough. And that's a lie straight from the pit of hell. The one person who went back to said thank you to Jesus was a Gentile. When Jesus died on the cross, he said, it is finished. And what happened to the temple is very, very interesting. The curtain, the, the curtain that separated the Holy of Holies from the people was torn from top to bottom. And that means that we now have access to the Holy of Holies. Before that, only the priest could go in. And they tied a rope to his ankles so that if the priests were struck dead during the ceremonies, if the priests weren't pure and there was sin in their life and sin in their heart, they could be struck dead. But you couldn't go in there and get them. And so they, they'd tie bells to their feet so that they could hear them moving around so that they, was, they, they knew they were still alive. And if the bells quit ringing, then they'd pull the rope and pull him out of there yeah. because they couldn't go in and get him. So, and the reason... It's a great picture of just what the justice of God is. God was pure, and, and only people that were pure could be before him. And so he creates this great picture of the justice of God, creating an great, even greater picture of the love of God. So you have this just God where only the pure can come to see him. Jesus died to make you that pure. And all you have to do is accept that gift and then you can walk through that, that curtain in that temple because the curtain in the temple was torn in two. When, and you read it in, in the Word of God. When Jesus died and gave up his spirit, the curtain was torn from top to bottom. What that means is you have access to God. You don't have to wait till Sunday morning and wait and hear what the pastor has to say, although I'm sure it's good and I'm sure it's going to be blessed of the Lord in most cases. But what it means is that you tonight can open the word of God and say, God, speak to me. God wants to have a dialogue with you. God wants to have a relationship with you. Um, but what God's really been speaking to me is about that, that curtain was torn. A curtain was torn. God, Jesus, did not go to the cross for you to trade a prison of sin for a prison of religion. See, in the days of Jesus, when the Pharisees and the Sadducees were there, they, they uh, kept people under this, this burden of rules. And Jesus spoke to the Pharisees and the Sadducees, and he said, you, 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 you don't even keep your own rules, and yet you saddle and burden the people with your rules that you yourselves cannot even keep. Jesus died so that you can have access to the Father through him. And then he rose again proving that he is the Son of God. But the one thing that I really want you to hear tonight is that curtain was torn. There was a reason why that was torn, because you now have access to the Father. And the, the way you do that is through Jesus Christ, because that curtain was corn, torn when he died. So as you accept Jesus Christ and say, I accept Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior, I want to have access to God. That is how you get through that curtain. And uh, all you have to do is open your Bible and say, God, Jesus, I just want you in my life, and I want you to reveal truths to me. And the Holy Spirit, the teacher, will come and reveal those truths to you. Amen. And as you pray that prayer, um, and you read the Word of God, and you pray that with, with a heart that's open to hearing the Word of God, God will speak to you, and he'll say things to you through that word of God, and what you'll find is you'll read it, and you'll say, boy, I never, I never read it like that before, and there'll be new meanings and new revelations that will come out of that book. Amen. How are we doing on time? Oh, we're a little bit long, but that's okay. Are we not going to cut off, are we? No, we're, we're good. Oh, we're good? Yeah, we've got some extra time. That's why I put the second tape in. That's oh, why you okay. pause for 10 seconds in the middle. Oh, yeah, that was that, that, was that lunch break I had for 10 yeah. seconds. Yeah, I hope you ate the hot dog real quick. I, that was awful fast. I, I, so, um, <laughs> boy, what do we want? Uh, announcements. Oh, there's just so much to talk about that, that's happening here. It's, yeah. it's unbelievable. Yeah. Um, we have a teaching for the um, end times and prophecy. A lot of interest in that because of the oh, things yeah. that are happening in the world, yeah. happening with Israel and everybody's wakes up in the morning and turns on the news and and 
there's, there's so many people that are living in fear right now. It's like, oh man, what's going on? Am I going to turn on the news tomorrow and World War III is going to break out? It might. However, Jesus said, don't be afraid. That's right. So many times in the Bible, he said, do not fear. For I am with you, even to the ends of the world, ends of the age. Um, you don't have to be afraid, no matter what happens. Even if it means your death, this life is not the end game. No. Because absent the flesh, you're present with the Father. You're present with Jesus. Absent from the body, you're present with the Lord. Um, Can I say something real quick? Sure. The guy who said a couple of weeks ago that the end of the world was going to take place, the rapture. Oh, yeah. We're still here. Yeah. Well, you know, that was uh, uh, May 21st, um, the 11th year, you know. Yeah. It's supposed to be at 6 p.m. at night. There's 24 time zones around the world. Right which is against what the Bible teaches. And uh, the Bible says in, in uh, uh, Matthew chapter 24, heaven and earth shall pass away, but my words shall never pass away. You know, right. I will not pass away. But that day and hour knoweth no man. No, not the angels in heaven, but my Father only. So when someone names a day, you know that's not the day. Yeah. <laughs> that's pretty good. What's amazing to me is... Jesus Christ, the Son of God, yeah. doesn't even know the day. Right. The That's angels right. don't know the day. Jesus doesn't know the day. Only the Father. And so... But, but a when, lot of people believe that. When you come across as a human being, as a man here on earth, and say, I figured it out. <laughs> this word says, no, you haven't. <laughs> and so... Right. so if we say this word is, is uh, sacred and is um, the word of God, then all of a sudden you say, well, something in that book isn't right. And so you cannot, as a, as a man or a woman, say that you figured out when the end of the age is because this book says, no man knows. No one knows. So we're to live life like uh, Jesus is coming back tomorrow, but we're to live life to um, to we're to go on teaching the word of God and preaching and saving souls and bringing people into the kingdom of heaven. Um, we're to act in like there's another thousand years to bring people in because the longer Jesus delays in coming back, the more people will have a chance to reach and bring in the kingdom of heaven. I had a dream once about um, um, a lifeboat and I was involved in a ministry, and it was uh, we had a very, very difficult time, and it was an outreach, and, and some serious things went wrong. Um, it wasn't involved with Ephesian Vision Ministry or anything going on now. This was years ago, um, and some of the people said, "Well, I just can't do this again. I just can't do this again. It was too hard. I we just lost too much." And I had this, I had this thought, this, I want to call it a vision, but just this thought in my mind that it was like, you've seen the movie The Titanic, where there's all these bodies in the water floating and people are reaching up and trying to get into the lifeboat. And people in the lifeboat were afraid that if we put too many people on the lifeboat, the lifeboat will capsize. Mm -hmm. So we have to leave those people in the water because if we try to rescue them, we'll die ourselves. So many Christians have that mindset of, of, well, we're safe in our church, and if we try to help too many people, we'll not have enough for ourselves. That's a theology of a lack of God, where God thinks all things, when God says all things are possible to he who believes, then you're saying that that scripture isn't true. So the vision I had was this hand was reaching out through the fog, grabbed the end of the lifeboat and pulled it out like a telescope. And I felt God saying, as long as you keep putting people in that lifeboat, I will make the lifeboat bigger. And that is, that is a message for the church today. As long as you keep putting people in the lifeboat, I will make the lifeboat bigger. What that means is as you reach out with the love of Christ, 
God will provide the resources to allow that to happen. That doesn't mean that you go and say you write a thousand dollar check when there's a dollar in the bank account, but it does mean that you don't worry about the resources. And if there's a, I'm speaking to someone out there, if, if there's something going on with your church or ministry and you're really wondering whether it's God's will to do it, pray about it. And if you have the peace of God, go ahead and do it because God will provide the resources. But talk to him first. Jesus said, I only do what I see the Father doing. I only do what I hear the Father doing. We are supposed to act like Jesus Christ. Not that we are, but he's an example of a, of a man rightly related to the Father through the Holy Spirit. And that is an example of what we're supposed to be. We're not supposed to live in fear. We're not supposed to say, oh, don't help those people. Don't put any people in the lifeboat because the lifeboat will capsize. We're not supposed to say, well, we don't want to give any more money to the church because, um, and this isn't trying to encourage you to give more, but this, what I am speaking about is this attitude of fear and I don't have enough and I've got to hold it close to me because I might not have some tomorrow. Um, God is saying, I'll make the lifeboat bigger. And he will. And as you trust him, you'll see him do that. So do not be afraid to help people that really need it. There are people here in Bend, Oregon, there are people living in the forest because they don't have a place to live. Jesus said, if you help the least of these, you're, it's as like you're doing it to me. We need to help those people. Don't be afraid. God is your provision, and God will make the lifeboat bigger. Amen. We have time for a prayer request? Sure. Could you uh, uh, pray for all of the churches in Ben and Redmond and sisters and Sun River and pray for all the pastors sure. to give them wisdom and courage and strength and, and just keep them in good health Okay. and preach the word. Lord, we just pray for all the pastors in Bend, in Central Oregon, in the state of Oregon, the nation and the world. God, specifically, we pray for Central Oregon because that's where we live. Lord, I pray for pastors who are tired. I pray for pastors who just simply need a word from you, a word of encouragement to go on. Lord, I pray for provision for those pastors. I pray for strength. Tonight as they sleep, I pray for just this really deep spiritual rest in you so that they wake up invigorated and wake up uh, refreshed in the Holy Spirit. Lord, I pray for an encounter with pastors tonight, an encounter with God, that they can hear your voice, they can sense your presence, and they can tap into this, this well of water that never goes dry. Jesus said, if you drink from me, it's the well that will never run dry. Amen. If you drink from this normal well, you'll thirst again. But if you drink from me, you will never thirst. Amen. It's the living water that we're after. And Lord, I pray for the living water for the pastors. Lord, we are here, as pastors, we are here to, to share your life. We are here to let the, the presence of God be seen in us. We are here to disciple believers in the power and the authority of Jesus Christ, that Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. The same miracles that happened in the days of Pentecost and in the days of the early church are still available today for believers who believe. Without faith, it is impossible to please God. God is looking for men and women of faith who will stand out and walk the faith. Lord, I pray for pastors to be encouraged. Lord, I pray for pastors who have a word in their heart that they are afraid to speak out because Amen. they're afraid of how it will be uh, received. Lord, I, I bind that spirit of fear Amen. and I cast it out. Lord, I replace that instead with a, a, a spirit of faith, a spirit of, of, of encouragement a spirit of courage to speak the word of God. If there's a pastor listening right now and you know that there's something that God's been burning in your heart to tell your congregation and you've been afraid to do it because you're afraid of how it will be uh, misinterpreted, 
don't be afraid. Amen. Fear is not of God. Amen. Just pray about it and seek the Lord, and God will, uh, God will give you the desires of your heart, which, if you're rightly related as a shepherd of the flock, the desire of your heart is to teach and lead people and encourage them in their walk with Jesus Christ. Amen. So we pray for those pastors. Amen. 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 Thank you. What else? Um, a lot going on. There's something I'd like to tell you, but I can't do it. Maybe until tomorrow. Maybe next time we're here, we'll, we'll visit about it. And it's about preaching uh, more opportunities for us to preach the Word of God on the Internet. And we're really, really excited about it. And it, 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 we put the plans together today. And, in fact, we're putting some of the mechanics together tonight and getting some of the computers ready to do it. And we're excited about it because Jesus said... Go into all the world and preach the good news. Mm -hmm. Preach the gospel of Jesus Christ. And that's why we do so much on the Internet. Because we can be here speaking tonight in Bend, Oregon, and we can be talking to people in... Um, we checked one of our streams today, and we've had people listening from Tunisia. Uh, Hong Kong, I believe. Uh, one of our streams, the, the, the longest listening sessions were from Russia. The Russian Federation. Uh, listening to yeah. some of our preaching. And uh, so the word is going out. It's not just going out from here, but there's a lot of ministries that are really engaging in the Internet. And one of the things that we want to do on the Internet is we're going to have some audio-only streams because there are places where the word is going. In fact, the audio from this session will be on one of our audio streams. Um, but they can't watch us because they might be seen watching Christian teaching. But they can listen, and they can listen discreetly because nobody knows what they're listening to. But they're listening to the Word of God being preached. They're listening to Bill and others uh, preaching the Word. So um, we believe the Internet, which the enemy has used for so much evil, it's time to use it for good. It's time Amen. to use it to spread the kingdom of God throughout the planet. Uh, because where the Word of God is, there is the presence of God. Amen. Jesus said, my word shall not return void. When the word of God is spoke, Jesus said, my word will not return void. Mm -hmm. Amen. To say anything else would say Jesus is a liar. He said, my word, my word spoken will produce results. People will be saved. People will be set free. And that's why we're so excited about getting the word of God on the Internet. Because uh, there's, we're just the only people in this room tonight. But there's people listening online. And there's people watching online. And there's people that we listen to the audio later on. Uh, and we're reaching souls in Hong Kong and Russia and Tunisia. There was another one from Tunisia. I don't have the list in front of me. But uh, France, Germany. Had a lot of listeners in Germany for some reason. Uh, but bless you. If you're listening in those countries or any that I haven't mentioned... Uh, New Zealand, Australia, uh, Singapore, um, Hong Kong. Uh, we're praying for you. We are praying for you Amen. and believing Amen. for revival in your land. And revival in that you have, you, just, you, you embrace this relationship with God. You come to this realization that God is alive and God is real in your life. But when we talk about revival, we're talking about... Um, not wonderful miracles and so on and so forth, but that will happen. But what we're talking about is something deeper. We're talking about a knowing that, that God wants to know you and be known by you. Mm -hmm. One of the analogies of a relationship between the believer and Jesus is a, is a bridegroom and a bride. And the intimacy that occurs in that relationship is, is one of the mysteries of the gospel. And and that is the closeness, that is the intimacy, that is the knowing uh, between you and Jesus that he's looking for. He's looking for dialogue. He wants to hear your heart. He wants to work with you. He wants to know you and be known by you. Um, pray about that. Because God wants to, God just doesn't want to be this far off, figure on a wall on a cross where you just feel so removed from him that you have no way to even come close to him because the enemy wants this separation between you and God but Jesus wants to come down off that church wall 
and Jesus wants to come into your life and Jesus wants to be there every day, every minute of your life. Even if you're going through trials and tribulations, even if you're overseas and you're being beaten for preaching the gospel, God is with you. God is with you. Amen. Be encouraged. We could, we could do this all night. Oh, I could. <laughs> But we're all, we're all a part of the body of Christ. And Amen. We're all that bride getting ready, and we have a, a, a dress without spot or wrinkle. Mm -hmm. Because of what Jesus did on the cross. For what Jesus did. But if it was in the natural, and it's also in the supernatural, but if it was in the natural, the music is beginning to play. Uh -huh. Here comes the bride. Yeah. So we better have our dress all ready. Uh, everything about us, the hair, the, whatever a bride does to get ready, walking down the aisle, because uh -huh. that trumpet could blow any second. Yeah, it could. So it's not a question of saying, well, how do I get ready? It's a question of just getting alone and saying, Jesus, come into my heart. Make me a born-again Christian. But, I believe. But we should act like he's not going to come back for another thousand years, because what can happen with some Christians is to say, well, Jesus is coming back tomorrow, so I'll just kind of sit here at the bus stop and wait for him. Uh, no, because, because if you do that, there will be people that will not get into the kingdom when Jesus does come back. Jesus said, don't sit and wait for me. He said, go and make disciples of all nations. That's something you're going to hear us preach until you're probably sick and tired of hearing. But that's what Jesus Christ said. He said, go and make disciples of all nations. So that's what we're doing. That's what, we, that's what we all need to do as Christians, uh, to go and do it. Go and do the stuff. And don't just sit and say, well, the world's going to hell, and, and uh, I'm saved, and, and uh, I've got my fire insurance paid. So I'll just kind of wait here and, and the sweet by and by, and, and I'll be here when Jesus is ready, and everybody else can just figure it out on their own. That's not what God said, because somebody came to you and somebody shared Jesus Christ, and if they hadn't done that, you wouldn't be where you are now. So Jesus is telling you, and I'm speaking to somebody tonight, Jesus is telling you that you need to share the gospel. And I know sometimes it's difficult, especially in work situations, to, to, to share the gospel. I know how difficult that is. Um, but pray about it. And... The best sermons are those we preach with our lives. Amen. The best sermons are those we walk out. And when people see you doing things that others don't do, and they say, well, why, why did you do that when everybody else is doing the wrong thing, stealing or, or uh, taking, um, uh, what, what's the word I want, embezzling from their job or stealing you know, a pack of gum or stealing from their workers or stealing from their uh, employers. Why aren't you doing that? Well, because I'm a Christian, and because that's just not how I am. That's just not what I do. And 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 I'll say, well, don't you just have to follow a book of rules? It's so much more than that. And I just pray that that with your life, you can really speak into their into their lives. And as things like like the tornado in Massachusetts happen, that um, people can see believers who are solid in their faith and see how they respond to situations like this. And I pray that they see Jesus Christ in that. Amen. So be encouraged. Amen. Tonight. If we do the do's, we won't have to worry about the don'ts. There you go. <laughs> Praise God. Praise God. We'll see you next uh, Thursday night at 7. Don't forget tomorrow night we'll be live on the Internet with uh, End Times and Prophecy with Tom Watson. And next week, the 10th of June, We'll have the class here, but it won't be online because I'll be out of town and I am run the camera. So uh, we'll have to take a week off off from the the next Friday in times class. But we'll be back the following week. Is and uh, the plan is to be here teaching in times and Book of John okay. as long as we're alive or until Jesus comes back. Amen. One or the other. So. Okay. Thank you. Thank have you. a good night. Good night. Thank you very much. God bless you.